All right, this week I'm joined by Jeff Green. Jeff's a buddy of mine. We just got back from an overlanding trip a weekend or two ago. Had a great time. Wanted to have him on to talk all about that, what overlanding is and all that stuff. So it's going to be a great episode, Jeff. Thank you for joining me. Yes, thanks for the invite. I'm excited to discuss this. Yeah, dude. We, I had a great time a couple weeks ago. You've done this for, what, seven, eight years now, overlanding trips? Yeah. That was yeah. This experience, so I thought it was a great time. Yep, I started in 2017. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's been a good run. I want to dig into that, but I want to define what overlanding is for anyone that's listening. So do you mind giving your version of what that is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question because I think a lot of people sort of confuse overlanding with four by fouring or off-roading sometimes. And they are kind of two separate things. But to me, overlanding is a self-reliant form of travel, basically, where the journey is actually the primary focus, not necessarily the destination. It's about traveling and enjoying the traveling as you go. Uh, it usually covers long distances. Quite often we're kind of off-grid or remote locations. And it's just to get out and enjoy nature, enjoy camping, be self-sufficient as possible. And then we usually incorporate principles of like leave no trace and tread lightly just to respect the land and leave things better than we found them. Mm -hmm. I, I could see how someone would think it's just four by four. Because to me, it's like you got to have your Jeep and it's off-roading stuff. But the way you described it, I think, is a little bit better. You know, because I really did enjoy the journey. It was me, you, your daughter, Lily, my daughter, Aubrey the four of us and the fun was the time in the vehicle and driving around. And I actually really enjoyed the fact that there were four other vehicles with us and what it was like to look out for each other and call things out and stick together. And so there's those kind of aspects to it as well. Cause it doesn't seem, I mean, I guess you could overland by yourself, but is it kind of a group thing like in general? Yeah. So the group that I go with and, and I've done, I mean, I did multiple years with Northeast adventure company and I'm currently riding with 207 Overland. Uh -huh. And it's, it's groups. There's usually, depending on where the trip is and how far the destination is, there's five to 10 cars that are likely in the group. People certainly can go alone and overlanding can be as short as a few days. It can be weeks. It can be months for some people, uh, depending on how far away their journeys and stuff are. But our groups are usually five to 10 cars. Um, let's talk about 207 Overland. So. Yeah. 207 Overland is, is it's an overlanding group, but correct me if I'm wrong, you connected with those guys, maybe through your previous travels, but is Facebook a big part of it? I think in general, people that like nature and be outdoors, the Overland community in general, they're relatively familiar with what their options are in the Northeast and, and who you can go ride with and the different types of trips and trainings that people offer. I had heard of 207 Overland, but I had friends the road with various companies, right? Because it's not always just about one or the other. You can certainly ride with a whole bunch of them and experience a lot of different things in different locations. But for me, I heard through other friends and I decided to jump into 207 because of a couple acquaintances I had. And I think uh, one of the things you touched on that to me is extremely important is we focus on the journey, right? In the In the destination when you get there, but what gets lost is the people. And I don't think I've ever found something else that I've enjoyed doing so much where it doesn't matter if you're total strangers and you're meeting for the first time or you've known people for years. The like-minded people that like to be in nature and Overland are just super easy to sit down at a campfire or wherever you might be and just have conversations with like you experienced and you feel like you've known them for a long time. Like that's yeah. a big piece of overlanding that I think it's overlooked because we focus on the vehicles or the cool places where the trip goes. But those trips are really about the relationships you form with the great people that you're with as well. Yeah. So when we went on the trip a couple of weeks back or a couple yeah. weekends back, I should say, you obviously knew the people or most of the people that were with us, but yeah. me as an outsider and my daughter, everyone was very welcoming to us, especially like a person with me that, like me that doesn't have that experience with overlanding. Just everyone was very welcoming to me, like happy to engage with me, talk about like common interests, talk about stuff, just hang out by the fire, engage Aubrey, you know. So I really appreciate that. And I got the sense that anyone that is into these type of trips is probably that way. You know, it's, it's my expectation, I guess, moving forward. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And like you did, you're great with people, but you did an amazing job talking to them. And 
everyone we were with were super social. I knew a couple of them and I knew the trail leader for that particular trip, but there were some people on that ride I had never met before. And obviously after one night of them at the first place that we stayed in Millinocket, you already start to feel close with them like you've been on multiple trips and you look forward to being with them on the next one. You know what I mean? I think Dave might have said it at one point. He's like, I feel like I've known you guys for a while or we're, we're old friends together. So I definitely can see how those trips really foster those relationships. So before we get to our trip, because I do want to dig into some of the mechanics of that to give people an idea of what you could expect if you went on an overlanding trip, 207 Overland is a club. All right, if you've been enjoying the podcast, I wanted to let you know that I am a residential loan officer with CMG Home Loans. If you or anyone you know is looking to buy a home or refinance, please let me know and I'd be happy to help. My contact information is in the description below. Back to the podcast. You pay to be a part of this club, right? Uh, yes. What does yes, that look so, like? So there's, you can be a member of it, but there's different benefits to having a paid membership and what level membership you have. And I'll just give you one example. But for me, I have, I think it's considered the platinum package, but it's to pay $180 a year. And that allows me to go on any of the 207 Overland trips that I want to go on, as many of them as I want to go on. And obviously you have to go through a registration process and the rides get challenging at times to get on because of their popularity. A bunch of people rush at the same time to get them. But if you can hop on the rides, there isn't an individual price per ride. You just pay an annual membership fee, which I think works excellent because if you're somebody that likes to go on five or six a year, you certainly get your value out of that. And if you're somebody that might only want to go on one a year, it's it's very financially reasonable to do that, just a common experience it for a weekend or however long you might go. I don't want any ideas in the owner of 207 Overland's head, but... 180 for the platinum package seems very reasonable, man. It's almost like you pay like 180 per trip. So to think that that's an annual membership and then it's just a matter of signing up for the trips once the schedule comes out. I mean, like, dude, I, mean, I think yeah. we talked about it. I, mean, I might even do that just for the, the off chance that I can get my vehicle out there next year at some point. But that's, that's a whole other conversation for the end of the podcast. There's, um, no, might. There's no might, Randy. You will do that. <laughs> but 180 is super reasonable. So... It just, I mean, it, it, it does seem like a no-brainer. What do you get if, if you sign up for a weekend? Like, what are you getting? You're getting someone that's a trail leader that has a trip planned out, and you know that they're running the show. They know what they're doing. They, you know, are looking out for you. Is that what you're signing up for on any one of those trips that you go on? Yes. And, I mean, I'm not going to. So, Justin Fickett is the owner. He does mm -hmm. a great job with it. Obviously, he could speak more to the business side because I'm not really – a part of that but if you sign up you're essentially paying to have somebody guide you on that excursion right they do all the pre-planning for it maybe they do the pre-running for it a couple of weeks before just to make sure where they're plotting out courses to take you is safe and the, the paths are open gates may or may not be um, closed but even when you're going through it they're doing all the navigation they're providing the leadership um, on what to communicate on the radio and how to respond to different things when you're making turns etc um, they're going to have some experience and recovery capabilities if something goes wrong, maybe some minor trail repairs if something goes wrong with the vehicle on the road. Mm -hmm. And just a general awareness of, again, back to kind of like leave no trace and tread lightly, uh, what the things you can and can't do are and what private land is and public land is so that you make sure you're going places that you've got permission to be and not trespassing on somebody else's property. So it's it's really I can't explain it any simpler than you can kind of just go into autopilot mode and follow the leader, right? Yeah. You follow the trip leader and you enjoy the experience and they're the one that take on all the responsibility to giving you and your family that great experience without having stressors or worries about anything. Yeah, which is huge. One of the things, so the, the leader that we had on our trip, his name is Brian. And one thing he said, it struck me, it was like, you know, if someone blows a tire, like, out there, you know, because we were on the, what, North Main Woods. So you're a little mm -hmm. bit out, out there. I mean, nothing crazy, but you're a little bit out there. But he mentioned if someone pops a tire, like trips over, like we're focusing on getting you out, fixing that problem and, you know, making sure that, you, you know, your vehicle can move. And I just kind of struck me as like, it seemed like everyone was on board with that. Like it would stink to have your weekend cut short or, if, you know, the plans affected by someone blowing a tire. But like the fact that he made it very clear that like, 
you know, if that happens to someone, like, that is the priority. It's not like, oh, man, we gave it a good shot. Like, you just hang here and figure that out, and we're just going to keep going on our trip. It was like no man left behind kind of thing, and I really appreciated that. Yeah, I, that's well said, and that is a philosophy. Obviously, something like a blown tire, everybody has to have a spare to come on the trips. Of course, But yeah. that might be as simple as changing a tire, right? And then the convoy continues. But if it's a bigger repair, then somebody's going to stay with that person transport that person back somewhere else where they can get the help, get somebody to respond to get that vehicle back out. And there was a trip just this past weekend with a foliage ride where the trail leader unfortunately had an issue with a trailer and a tent that got damaged, but they were able to persevere through it, continue on the trip. Other people had supplies like a spare tent and different things where they could continue on the whole journey and enjoy the weekend. And obviously yep. there's some things that need to be fixed after the ride is over, but People in Overland community have excellent knowledge. And I think as a trail leader, it's one of the things you look at is who who's coming with you on your trip. What can you learn about them when they're coming? And honestly, empower them and use their skill sets to help out on the journey. Because it's not just about the trail leader, right? It's about the cumulative knowledge and skills that the whole group has to get through any situation they may come across when they're out there. Yeah. And when you have a big enough group of people that... Like even in the smaller group that we had, like there's people that are more experienced and less experienced within that group. But I imagine if you have like a 10, 12 car convoy or 10 vehicle convoy, like there's going to be some people besides the trail leader that have some experience and um, which is nice. Is that what you can expect in a, in a normal trip? Is it 10 to 12? Is that the max we should say? Uh, 10 cars. So like I'm going to call it a usual ride, but the normal rides, the Friday through Sunday type weekend rides that occur throughout the year. Those are usually capped around 10 vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. And then the destination extreme trips, which I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit when we're chatting. Those are usually much further away and involves much more extensive planning. And most of those are capped around five vehicles. Some of yep. them can still take up to 10, but the more vehicles you add, the more you have to be aware of tread lightly and how your vehicles can impact the land. The more you mm -hmm. have to make sure you find campsites at the end of the night that can fit the number of vehicles you've got. There's just... With each vehicle you add, there's more complexities to think about. 100%. Yeah, and that brings us to this past weekend, because we had five vehicles, or two weekends ago, I should say, but we had five vehicles, and I don't know that our campsite would have been able to hold more than five vehicles. I mean, maybe it could have squeezed in a couple more, but if it was a 12-vehicle situation or a 10-vehicle situation, that definitely would have impacted things. So, yeah. Yeah. so the trip that we did was the ghost trains, something I had no familiarity with. Ghost trains... I mean, you can give a better summary than me, but for me, it was ghost trains were in the North Main Woods. There are some, it was like a, what, a, a logging type scenario between two rivers or something like that, where there was a train, and then they just kind of abandoned it because cost issues or who knows what, a long time ago. So you drive out to the middle of the North Main Woods, which again is no connection to cell phones, really dis disconnected from everything, and you go see these trains that are out in the middle of the woods, and then everything's kind of built around that, right? Yeah, so those those trains, they are referred to as ghost trains. They're on Eagle Lake um, mm -hmm. in North Main Woods. And then the tracks also connect down to Chamberlain Lake. Um, but they're, I mean, they're two locomotive engines that are literally abandoned in the middle of the woods that you saw, where it's about a three-quarters of a mile hike probably to get to the main trains. And then maybe another half mile or so down to the tramway on uh, Chamberlain Lake where you can um, I think it was 100 yards. I heard that second yeah, hike was yeah, 100 yards. We, we heard that from a very experienced trail leader that's a main registered guide. Um, <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah, it is not 100 yards, but that did make it more interesting too. But I think, I mean, obviously there is just nothing around it. So Maine has so many beautiful things like that, that unless you get out and explore, you don't even realize that you've got these scenic things like this that you can come across and experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that trip was built around that but you know we went to a few other places looking for a campsite yeah well, there was like a little river crossing there was a dam you know it, it was just a lot of driving around and check, enjoying the outdoors we're obviously looking for um <laughs> moose eagles bears did not have much luck but that's not always the case right like you're usually seeing something yes but hey we got to point this out because it does not happen a ton so we were tail gunners, which means we were the last vehicle in the convoy uh -huh. calling out when we're clear different obstacles and stuff so the trail leader understands how far we're spread apart, et cetera. 
And Brian, the trail leader, got over the radio at one point in a really excited manner, telling us that there was a moose, essentially, that ran out in front of him and was running in front of the convoy. And not just a moose, but it was a bull moose, which we just don't see as often as the females. And then so Randy and I are like driving and the girls are getting all excited. And with each car that catches up, they're hearing the moose is still here. The moose is still here. And I've been waiting forever to see a bull moose. Like I was just super psyched. And of course, the second we pull up, it takes off into the woods. And so we take off down the trail a little bit to try to find it. And those things, for the size of them, it's amazing how fast they disappear yeah. uh, in the woods as well. But outside of that, we saw a lot of dust. Uh, oh, we because... did see a lot of dust. That's one. And I want you to know, like, that wasn't, I don't know if it was discouraging for you, but it wasn't, like, discouraging for me. Or it didn't hamper my enjoyment. Obviously, got into all of our stuff, and I'm sure that's a pain in the butt. But, like, it was cool. Like, no dust, no dust. Like, it was still beautiful out there. But there was definitely, like, a lot of dust on these back road trails when you got five cars or more. I mean, it would have been even worse if there was more vehicles. It definitely gets kicked up. Yes. I don't think I've been on a ride. Maybe I'm not usually tail gunner, but probably because we were last in the stack where we got the most dust, mm -hmm. but it was super dry in North Maine woods. And so again, just to reference this past weekend on the foliage ride, it had just rained pretty heavily. Right. And so their experience was very different than ours with a lot less dust because it mm -hmm. had rained recently. And it, it didn't discourage me at all. I was obviously, I did feel bad for you being your first ride at some points because the beauty that is in North Main Woods mm -hmm. and being able to see Mount Katahdin and the foliage and everything else, or even see more wildlife because mm -hmm. bombing through the dust, you know, you can't see 10 feet in front of you. We probably missed some opportunities to see some more beautiful stuff, but that's just all part of the adventure, right? But we, we had a great view of Katahdin when we first started the drive. Our campsite was freaking beautiful. You know, we we were right on this body of water. I don't know which body of water it was, but like great sunset, you know, great great to wake up to in the morning. So it's like, yes, was there dust on some of the times we were traveling? Yes. Part of the deal, but like there was plenty of beauty to enjoy while you're out there. So so that that was a great trip. Yeah, anyone I would recommend that's listening, you know, if you take a look at the trips to to go look at. To me it would seem like a good beginner trip. Is that a way to say it? I mean, I know there's they're scaled on green and blue in terms of difficulty you could probably equate to ski difficulty are there green blue and black trips I don't know yeah, black. So, yeah yes uh, justin's website 207 overland.com they've got kind of gives you a definition of what those are i'm uh -huh. typically on the green ones family very family friendly there's not um there's not a lot of off-roading like rock obstacles and challenges and stuff so if you go from green to blue Blue rated is more technical and requires a little bit more stuff on your vehicle. And then black is the most technical where you're going to be doing some challenging trails and obstacles to get over and around, et cetera. And has a different set of requirements to go on those rides too. But what we did is green and they're, you could call them entry level is, is a term people will resonate with. But I think this is good timing to also touch on that when people think of Overland, I mean, like, just look at my Jeep. Right. Or look at our two gladiators. Some people might look at my gladiator with all this stuff put on it. And then somebody else might have a newer gladiator that doesn't have that stuff yet. And they might feel like I can't go. In I do that, that. We yeah. Do like, yeah. You know, what I mean, like I have a gladiator. It's a lot lower than yours. Doesn't have all the bells and whistles. And like yours is higher. And like not knowing anything, which we'll get into, like I would feel what you're the way you're describing. Yeah. And I mean, we want to kind of push the message out that 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 is a myth that isn't true. Most four by four capable vehicles with a decent tire, and I'm, I'm talking maybe a 31 inch or above, right? A good, reliable tire and four wheel drive. You can go on any of these green rated rides. We have some relatively stock type vehicles that come with us and experience all the same thing we do. Like we might have more bells and whistles and things that we like to add because I will also offer once you start overlanded, it becomes an addiction. <laughs> because there's always more you can spend and there's always more you want to buy and upgrade and it is never ending. But it is not a requirement to come on these trips. If you just want to get outside and enjoy the beauty of nature and disconnect from the real world, unplug, and go somewhere where maybe your cell phone doesn't work and just get outdoors, most four by four stock type vehicles are capable enough to come on these green green sorry green rated trips so biggest thing though is the times 
right? Like that's seems like it's the most important thing because we were talking about it. My tires might have a profile that doesn't necessarily work without me making some changes. So like, I guess if anyone was considering these green type trips and you've never been before, maybe it does make sense to talk to someone like you or Justin or someone just like, and yeah, my tires going to work because that's, that would be an issue. I think for me, at least. Yeah. I, th I think it's always a great starting point because you want to have a tire that's rated an all terrain tire and mud tire terrain tire that is rated with sidewalls that are durable enough to air down and go over obstacles or come in contact with sharp objects where you're not constantly slicing up your tires and likely to get a flat, right? You're going to want a very capable tire to come on the rides and you can build off that with a lot of other things. The setups are pretty cool. Like your setup's awesome, right? Like you have nice rack set up in the back. You have the tent on top. You get the fridge out back. You have it. I mean, everything's like, dude, you're have an awesome setup. You know what I mean? Brian, who was the leader of our trip, his setup was like a legitimate command center on the road, you know, with all the screen technology and, and everyone that joined had like some aspect of like an awesome setup. So I could see how that would get addicting because like my mind starts going to all the things that I could add to my Jeep and it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, but it's addicting, but in a fun way, because if you stick with it, like every little bell and whistle that you add makes life easier. But I will also offer what I have learned over doing this since 2017 is the more you add, the more stress it can add at times too, right? There's still something to be said about the old school throwing a cooler in the back of a vehicle with a ground tent and just going and enjoying yeah. your time, right? You don't have to have all the bells and whistles, but there are a lot of things that you can add that you saw that make life easier. And there's a lot of, I mean, we could get into what you can add and different things, but just having some basic capabilities of you lose cell service. Do you have an emergency method of communications with you maybe, right? So you have a paper or gazetteer in your vehicle with you. So if electronics and stuff aren't working, you've got something to take out and be able to navigate yourself out safely back to where you need to get to. So, I mean, it's, it's a deep rabbit hole that once you start going down, it branches off in a lot of directions and it's just, it's amazing experience. But it's fun, man. Like, I mean, when I say addiction or you say addiction, it has like a bad connotation to it. But like, it's it's fun, man. It's a hobby. You know, it's something you enjoy. You know, it brings, brings flavor to your life. I think we're all kind of in life trying to find the different things that we enjoy and gravitate towards. And this if this is that thing, like money on those things. There's there's worse things to do than outfit your vehicle to do these type of trips if you truly enjoy being with the people and being outside. So I think I it's think good. I think it's well said and an important point is you saw it with Aubrey on the last trip. Like you just get moments with your kids, right? Like I usually have Lily or Isla, sometimes the whole family with me, but you have those unique and special moments that you might have with your child when you're out in the middle of nowhere, conversations that would never take place at home, touch points and connections with your child that you get to have that and their memories that I am never going to forget. And every penny I've ever spent overlanding has been more than worth it because of those moments that I'll take with me to the next life. You know what I mean? 100%. Yeah. yeah. You're, both of our daughters are 12 years old. So it's like, you know, they're living that 12 year old life. It is hard to like pull them from their phones or, you know, the stuff that they're doing with their friends or field hockey or sports and all that stuff. So it's like when they're out there with us, like they're out there for the most part, you know, like they mm -hmm. still found ways to use their phones and stuff, although they didn't have the connection, but like, yeah, there's definitely some, some moments out there that you can cherish. No doubt about mm -hmm. that. Yes. Um, so I want to talk about some of the cool trips that you have been on <clears throat> and get to some of the potential trips that 207 Overland is putting together and some of the more extreme stuff. So when you think back at your seven, eight year run of overlanding, like what are some of the highlight trips that come to mind for you? Well, that is a great question because I know this is going to probably sound corny or cliche in some kind of sense, but mm -hmm. every single ride I go on whichever company I've been with or wherever I've gone, I've come back and been like, man, I love that. That's one of my favorites. Like it's just so hard to explain when you get out there and just experience different things, whether it's Maine or Canada or Vermont or New Hampshire, right? Like you just, there's so much beauty in New England and different things to see that you're like, wow, where's this one fall in my top five or 10 now? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll offer my favorite ever probably was a trip with Northeast Adventure Company going up to New Brunswick, Canada, to the Cape Spencer area. And we camped in 
Bay of Fundy, which has the largest tides in the world. Great group of people. Camped right on a beach one night, capped on some extremely scenic cliffs. Anyone that's been up in the Cape Spencer area understands what I'm talking about, but that one is one that's always going to be right at the top of my list. Mm -hmm. uh, North Main that's Woods, honestly, is always one of my favorites just because I like being off the grid and no cell service and in the middle of nowhere, far from people and the strong likelihood to see wildlife. I think Green Mountains in Vermont are a beautiful place that I've gone. Is that the top of the world one? Top of the world. I mean, we went into Vermont on top of the world this year. I'm thinking of one a few years ago. We did one called Green Mountain Mission, where you're able to go through some cool caves in Vermont and stuff that yep. I'm referring to more. But top of the world, we did go into Vermont and stay at a hip camp. Think of it Is like in camp above the childline. Yes, yes. I had Mandy and both girls with us. I was a whole family trip, and right. that one was amazing because we stayed at this hip camp on a mountain. And when you get up and come out of your tent, we were high enough that you literally were on top of the clouds and could look down and see the clouds covering like this valley below you. Like it's just, those are those things I'm talking about where that's like a memory burned in my head from that trip that I'm never going to forget. Right. right. The two this year that I think are just worth touching on the total eclipse, right. That, that people got to get some, tor some type of experience on. We're supposed and, to go with you. Yes. We're supposed to go on. This was going to be our first ride together yeah. with Ken, Lily, and Aubrey. Um, but all the snow that hit before, I think, is dad's. That was in, was it in March? Uh, April? April? I think it was April, and we went to Jackman. But yeah. we, drove, we drove there when the storm was still con happening over there. Yeah, there was um, two snowstorms in a handful of days, yeah. and it took, like, what was a, would have been a fairly normal camping trip, clear ground, like, whatever, to, yeah. like, one that didn't make sense to bring our kids to and it was the right decision but you got a chance yeah. to go up to jackman and watch the, the solar eclipse from the 100 percent totality yeah um, that's that's one trip that i'm never going to forget because again even the 99 percent to the 100 percent, there's a totally different experience totally. seeing that whole eclipse and things go completely dark get cooler and then get to watch it come back the other side like the total eclipse ride was amazing and then another one that i think they do a B-52 crash site visit every year that I took Isla and my nephew Jameson on this year. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure what they're going to think, right? Maybe that won't resonate with them as much. The B-52 crash site on Elephant Mountain, which is up by Moosehead Lake in Greenville, mm -hmm. it's a somber experience to hear about the crash and see all the wreckage and the trees that are still there. Um, but this year, what made it even more unique is that we were able to go through North Main Woods up to Loring Air Force Base. And it's the first time that I know of where anyone was given permission to camp right on the property um, at the hangar. And we were able to do a full... Privately owned at this point. What's that? It's privately owned at this point, right? Because someone says yeah. like an Air Force Base, you think, oh, the government still owns that, but like a person actually owns this at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's privately owned now from what I understand. And you need permission to be there. I, I believe people probably go that don't have it, but you should have yeah. permission. Shouldn't go without it. And then we got to tour the whole base and it was just amazing. Even looking at some of the bunkers where the bombs and everything used to be like Jameson and Isla were like really into it, enjoyed it. And actually what we just missed on that one was that once a year, they actually land a B-52 stall on that airstrip. And it happened the following weekend from when we camped there. And Justin went back with his family and took some amazing pictures and videos of it landing. And I'm, I heard in 2025, part of our goal on that trip might be to plan the weekend where we can camp there, but also be there when the B-52 lands. So that would be an awesome one for people to consider going to as well. So I've been from Maine my whole life, as we discussed. I had no clue that a B-52 plane crashed out in the woods up there. You know, like, I don't know that many people realize that that's out there to go look at. So I'm sure that was an awesome, awesome scene yeah. to take a look at. Yeah, it is. I mean... Each time you see it, I mean, I think it has the same impact on you because of um, what happened. And that's, again, that's a relatively easy one to get to that's just a short distance off the main roads. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound like it was that far from where we were. No, well, yeah, we drove right past the road that would have led us about 15 minutes down to where the crash site is. Yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I know, well, the schedule's not out for next year, right? When's the schedule come out for next year? So the Destination Extreme schedule was just released a few days ago. That is a brand new thing that Justin's doing in 2025, which obviously 
we can touch on if you want. The regular schedule, because it, it, there are some people kind of curious of this, which is like the weekend type trips that they do on a year to year basis. That will be released, I believe, December 4th, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. At 7 p.m. is the date that Justin has set for us to announce all the rides that we're doing as trip leaders for 2025. So I'll make sure, make sure I share that. So not knowing exactly what is planned, is there anything that you're specifically looking forward to that you assume that will be a trip? Uh, yeah, like, any, trip? anything that I'm a trail leader for. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Trail leader, I mean, might as well talk about that right now. So... That's exciting for you. Congratulations. You are an official trail leader this upcoming season, right? Uh, yes. Yes. I re I just came on board. So I'm super excited and anxious to start that process. But honestly, I have a lot of great trail leader mentors mm -hmm. um, to learn some things from. And I, I'm going to, at minimum, be planning three of my own yep. um, next year. So those will be part of the 2025 20, release that we do December 4th. Uh -huh. um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to some of the other great rides that I know the trail leaders are putting together. Justin does try to mix it up where you have some of the similar experiences from year to year for people that may, maybe you still want to see the B-52 or the trains, right? Like that just draws interest every year, but also putting twists on different things and adding some new unique things. So if somebody's coming back for a second time on any particular ride, it's got a little different flair to it. So yeah. The trail leaders, from what I've seen behind the scenes, already have some really cool stuff that they're planning and places to visit. And then the uh, destination extreme trips, which we can jump into that when you're ready. It's just a whole, whole new ball game for 207 Overland now. I do want to get into that, but real quick before we move on to it, congratulations yeah. on being a trail leader. It's awesome. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Seeing how you handled the trip a couple of weekends ago. Like I have no doubt that you'll do a great job on it. So I'm sure Justin's lucky to have you and I think it's going to be great. So I, we talked a little bit about what you were envisioning for your trip, but I'll let that, let you announce that another time. I think it's going to be awesome. But that brings me back to another question real quick though. The trips really are determined by the trail leaders. You know, it's almost like Justin says, all right, Jeff, you got three, Brian, you get a couple, so-and-so you have a few. And then it's like, you're coming up with those trips and then he'll release those on December 4th. Yeah. And, I mean, Justin is super flexible. Uh, he really gives us all autonomy to come with, come up with what we want. You pick at a weekend that you want, right? You design the trip to go where you want. They're generally going to be in Maine. That's part of what 207 Overland does, right? Is focus on the beauty that Maine has to offer. Although Destination Extreme is now taking that to other crossing borders to different countries. We'll get into that. But yeah, so... If a trail leader only wants to do one ride, they might only do one ride for the year. If they want to do four or five trips, they're empowered to do four or five trips and as much as they're willing to take on. So it's definitely great. Yeah. But it kind of answered my question about like, someone might do ghost trains, but it's not like, okay, ghost trains is always the second weekend in September and B-52 is always this weekend and whatever. It's like, it really is driven by those trail leaders. So I'll look forward to that schedule coming out and couple months now but let's talk about those 207 overland extreme destination trips because we were talking a little bit about the fact that they were going to be announced after we returned they were announced there was a whole youtube video it was a big event that they were announcing those why don't you explain what they are yeah so destination extreme in 2025 is brand new for 207 overland and justin's had this vision for a long time and it's finally coming to fruition with him like he took a group of people to Newfoundland this year. It was right around 10 days or so. And just listening to the experience that that group had in Newfoundland and how that different culture and scenery and food and just everything about it, how it impacts you. And it really resonated with me on how much it impacted Justin and his family. And I think it really pushed him forward to continue pushing boundaries and taking people further and getting them out to experience new places that are outside of Maine, right? So I'm going to go over each of them or touch base on some of them. Yeah, if you can I just kind of mention what some of the, the – what? how many are there? Six? Five, yeah. six? I, there's going to be six of them in yeah. uh, 2025, I believe, and two that we've announced for 2026 already. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, again, it's really about crossing borders and visiting other countries and traveling to places that few other people actually get to travel to. So, let's, let's run through some of them. Sure, for yeah. all, I'll touch on all of them for all. I give, but like, what's the first one that comes to mind? 
Yeah, so I mean, I can just kind of run through them in order from from what I remember already. But mm -hmm. I think it's Trans Tioga, I believe is how you pronounce it, but Trans Tioga Challenge, which is in uh, northern Canada. That uh -huh. one isn't difficult terrain, but it takes you on a path, which I believe is the furthest northern point in Canada. And mm -hmm. when you get to the end of that trail, I believe you're 450 plus miles from the closest civilization. So that one is truly about your remote right you need to be prepared you need to be thinking about gas repairs Can we talk about that gas piece for a second like yes. dude, like what so 450 miles away from everyone like you have to have some serious gas you know like yeah, yeah there's there's a i believe the standard for justin on a lot of these trips is you need to have minimum uh, ability to travel 400 miles yeah. from the last gas station you might be able to get to Right. I mean, so we're talking 800 miles without filling up. I mean, we're talking, you know, 100 gallons of gas that you have to have, you know. Oh, no. I mean, I, I, no, I don't think it's, I don't see it being that much. I do it's believe. Like, I'm, I'm bad at math, but like in my mind, I'm like, dude, you have to have like a significant yeah. amount of gas. Whatever the math. I'm not going to try to figure just, out math. It's more than just the red thing on the side of your rack, you know. Oh, oh yeah. So those, you know, a lot of people might carry four or five gallons on the side of the vehicle, but trips like that, with that type of distance, you might be carrying 10 to 20 uh -huh. extra gallons in the, uh -huh. your vehicle somewhere um, so that you can push the boundaries with mileage. So you definitely have to prepare for that. Uh -huh. I believe you're able to have a gas up point because it's not like, there are some stops in some industry stuff that happens on that trans Tioga road uh -huh. when you're going. So I do believe there's a gas up point at some okay. place. And that's where you have to be able to, again, pushing it, you need to make sure that you've got 400 miles worth of fuel. And that's taken into consideration. Your mileage yeah. is likely going to drop on trails like that, right? Compared to maybe what during normal driving conditions. But Trans Tiaga is going to be an interesting one. All of these are, I think the shortest one is probably 10 days. But yeah. some of these trips are up to close to a month. I think the second one is OTAC. New Brunswick, so OTAC, uh, 207 Overland came up with OTAC in OTAM. So it means it stands for Overland Trek Across Maine and Overland Trek Across Canada. And that's basically a certain number of vehicles are able to come, and every person that's selected to come has a specialty. Somebody might be the cook for the trip. Somebody might be the canic, mechanic. Somebody right. might be the medical person. Somebody will be the navigator, the trip leader, et cetera. So each person that comes on the OTAC ride has specialized skill okay. and the goal is to stay 100% off pavement if possible, traveling from the starting point to the end point. It's all dirt and overland trails. Okay. So OTAC, uh, New Brunswick, um, that okay. one, I can't even remember the months that they all are, so I'll pass on that. But the second okay. one is OTAC Trans Quebec to Swish a Loop. And that's another one in Canada. And again, it's probably roughly 10 days, but that one's going from Quebec onto the famous trail that's called swish a loop and then this one the next one is the biggest the big one that uh surprised me for this year is it's a western trip so <laughs> the group is actually taken it's roughly three weeks i think but they're heading out west and going to glacier national park in montana yep. and then they're heading north through canada i believe harrison trail is one of the trails they're heading going over to vancouver island which now you're talking all the way on the pacific yep. ocean the west coast and then some of the other trails they're going to hit as they come back through Canada are the Whipsaw Trail, Caribou Chill Cotton Trail, Telqua Pass. And a lot of these are famous Overland places that popular pictures have been taken from. Yeah. Just amazing scenery. And I think that one's ending at Hyder, Alaska before they come back to Maine. <laughs> that just kind of blows your mind thinking about the magnitude of that trip yeah. and the thousands of miles that you're going to be traveling. They're following that up by Newfoundland, Return to the Rock. So they're going back to Newfoundland, but this time the 10 days is stretched to like three weeks, I believe, yep. because it's a different path they want to take up and so much more that they want to explore that they didn't get to see the first time. So they're going back to Newfoundland, which is going yep. to be an amazing trip. And then they have a unique Southern Expedition, which honestly, I love the idea of this one too. So the Southern Expedition, it's another one that's somewhere probably between two and three weeks, but they're heading down to Missouri to overland through the Ozarks, which is just a whole different set of beauty and overland challenges that come with that. And then from the Ozarks, they're heading over to Florida 
And there's a there's a trail called the Florida Adventure Trail, which is roughly 1,200 miles, I think, of overlanding in Florida before they circle back up and come to Maine. So this is all over. Those trips alone are like, I'm talking 25,000 miles of travel wow. driving from a six-month period. And Justin's going to be, Justin's reaching out further, right, and expanding beyond just maybe current 207 Overland members now to good people. Could be all across the country or other places. Opportunities yeah. to come on these adventures that they want to explore. And I know I'm That's, not uh, the last what? two, and these are big ones, buddy, right? Yeah. 2026, he's taking a group of people to New Zealand. Which is freaking insane. Yeah, just to think about. I mean, honestly, there's probably, that's unmatched beauty. Like, you see things in New Zealand that you might not see in other parts of the world, but New Zealand and Alaska. So these are two trips, too, that are somewhere between two and three weeks. But that trip is fully planned where you fly to New Zealand and you fly to Alaska. And those trips have fully outfitted, fueled up Overland vehicles ready for the group when they get there. You have a guide that jumps in with the group and takes you, and you're off exploring in rented Overland vehicles for the duration of time that you're in New Zealand and Alaska. Like, it's just, it's amazing what he's putting together. That's super cool. I mean, that sounds like these are places, like, you would never see otherwise. Yeah. Right? Like, a lot, a lot of those a lot of those roads and trails that you're talking about, it's like, you don't get to see those things as just like a normal, everyday person. So, truly unique trips. And that's, hey, I, I hope that they all go well. That's... That sounds fantastic. Are you going to do any of them or what? Oh, well, I mean, let's the time let's off is tough. Off. That's tough, right? Getting two to three weeks vacation and then just you're leaving your family or be bringing your family. Like those are challenges. So I, I was trying to lose you in a tough spot with, with Mandy. So I wanted you to commit to something right now on air. And uh, I'm going to commit to a smaller one like Trans Tiaga or OTAC New Brunswick or something. You know, I can take a week off and yeah. Mandy would support me going. But 2025 for me on a personal level, is really going to be focusing on being the best trail leader I can be yeah. and putting some local trips together that people will enjoy. And I will, I have my eye on New Zealand, although I don't know how I would ever make that work. But how do you not stop and try to think about it, right? It, it does sound amazing. And, you know, I think, it, like, again, our kids are the same age, our kids are friends. Like, it's, you know, the idea of leaving for that period of time is hard. But hey, maybe, maybe you can make it happen. My hope is that these trips go well. And it's a thing, you know, if it's not now, it's five years from now or something, you know, and, and maybe they do a New Zealand trip every few years or something, but I'm certainly anxious to hear how it all goes. Sounds yeah. like a great idea. Me too. Yep. Anything else you want to add, man? I freaking enjoyed every single thing we talked about, but I don't know if there's anything else that you want to mention before we wrap it up. Oh gosh. I mean, no, like I've really enjoyed this talk too. I really enjoyed you. You got out there and came with, I, I guess I would probably just, re-emphasize the point that I know there's a lot of people out there that are maybe call them inactive members or just people on the periphery that are watching posts uh -huh. and like the outdoors and thinking about, man, I'd love to go. And I just kind of want to echo the point that you don't need one of these crazy decked out vehicles to be able to come on these trips that most people probably already have a vehicle that's capable or pretty close to capable of coming on these grain rated rides and like just, don't be afraid to reach out to someone and ask questions or explore the idea because I like meeting new people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you probably saw a little bit different side of me than a lot of people do even here at home. Like when I get out there, I just kind of, I feel free and I let go and I feel relaxed and it's just a different, almost feel like a totally different person than I feel in regular day-to-day -day life with the stressors and everything else that are going on. Right. So if you're somebody that's interested in overlanding and you're thinking about joining, like I would highly encourage people to take a look at what they've already got because they're probably capable of coming right now and yeah. just come out and explore and give it a shot and have fun. Love it, man. I think that's a good place to end it. So thanks for talking today. Thanks for bringing me out. I'll look forward to talking to you and getting on the books with you again for something. And we'll, we'll see what happens with my vehicle. Mm -hmm. get I'm a, you're coming. I'm not letting you off the hook now, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the time and we will talk soon. Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. See you. Yep. See you later.